Welcome back, everybody, to the Dr. Lino Show, a little less fear podcast. Today, I would like to introduce Jason Pike, national best-selling author and book, a decorated combat veteran with multiple deployments. Lieutenant Colonel Jason Pike served 31 years in the United States Army as both an enlisted and officer, including nine years overseas in five countries. Jason earned over 30 service awards and badges and survived a wicked amount of military training. Thrown under the bus and ghost lighted by his own superiors, arrests and investigations are big stories here. Jason's brutal honesty on how he did it while disclosing many secrets about how he survived his unique, the, how he survived this is unique. With a straightforward account of one man's journey, he inspires audiences nationwide at speaking events and shows how to be resilient and to persevere no matter what disadvantages and life struggles may happen. Welcome, Jason Pike, Pike to A Little Less Fear Podcast. So nice to have you here. Hey, I'm, I'm very honored to be on your show, Reno. And uh, yeah, I've got a lot of stories. You could go through many episodes, of, but it's 31 years in the Army and nine years were overseas. And uh, yeah, that's uh, appreciated. That was a good description. That's the way it goes. Yep. Yeah, that, that's your incredible description. And so, you know, I understand that at age seven, you were you had an acute learning disability. Is this correct? That's correct. I was diagnosed. Well, the diagnosis at the time, they thought it was dyslexia. Now I'm kind of thinking it's some sort of a autism, maybe an Asperger syndrome. That was, I failed the first grade. I'm considered a national spelling. I, I failed English writing and English are my worst subjects, but I'm an author. Go, you can go figure that one out. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I thought, and, and so there was not a whole lot of expectations put on me by my parents because they said, well, we can sort of just leave this guy alone a little bit. <laughs> and that's, you know, so there wasn't a whole lot of expect. Every, every mother and father wants their kids to, you know, do well in education. Right, but, yes. uh, I, I wasn't doing it. Yeah, that's kind of, that's what it was. Uh, that's, uh, they just thought it was uh, maybe dyslexia, but I think maybe it was some, some, some form of autism is what mm -hmm. I'm thinking. Yeah. And then at age nine, you were diagnosed with osteomyelitis. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, that was very painful. So I had failure as far as academics, and then I had pain and dis dissolving of the bone, osteomyelitis. It's a bone disease that I, I triggered it by jumping in a swimming pool and bumping my knee, my left knee against the, well, I don't know. We, we all bump, we all bump our knees and things when we're yeah. kids, but this one created a, a bone disease where my bone dissolved uh, twice uh, during nine, and when I was nine and 10 years old, and uh, I was on crutches a lot, and sports, my dad loved sports, but I couldn't play sports during that time. My bone, I'm four, I'm 58 years old, but my left knee is around 49, because it, it actually, it, it dissolved, it went to a, a great big ball of pus and then through painful injections over a period of time we were able to get that thing down and yeah. and then it grew back <laughs> it grew back dis it disformed <laughs> and so it, my left knee definitely looks a lot stranger than my right knee so yeah that's so I had I had pain and failure were things that were introduced to me at a young age that probably set me up a little bit in the story different than most yeah and how did that set you up as far as like your, your story being a little different? I think a lot of people look at me as, well, he's disadvantaged. Maybe he's a slow learner. Maybe he's physically not as good. I went into the army and I served 31 years, but I think knowing that I, I, I learned early on that pain and failure were just, uh, kids are, are just normal. I mean, kids are resilient. I think kids are stronger than adults in many ways. And Absolutely. They, they just like, okay, they scrape their knees and it's like no big deal. Right. If, it, it's yeah. Like, they oh, get back whatever. up and start running again yeah, or doing the same running. thing. An adult, let's say adult falls down. He's like, Oh, I scraped my knees. Yeah. So, the, <laughs> so the adults are a little, and so, but I thought even, I just thought that was just a normal thing that happens. And I sort of, that set me up a little bit different when me meaning stronger, I think. Uh, compared to other people. So if you've made great grades all your high school years, and then you go to college, and you make a C and everybody, oh, the world's crashing now. 
but no, so, <laughs> so, no, right. or if you never got hurt as a kid and then mm-hmm. you got hurt as an adult it's like oh no I, I scraped my finger but so that set me up different as far as the resilience and the grit that makes I sense think. yeah yeah and so since it set you up as far as the resilience goes, it's like you already had gone through a lot as a kid. You were you had dissolving bone, you had gone through injections and a little, uh, I guess you could say a lot more pain than your average kid. And so by this time now growing up, I can imagine that you had a, formed a different type of resiliency than your peers. Yeah, I feel I did. I felt that um, I felt that I had a strong, oh, at the time, I just thought it was normal. I didn't, I thought every kid probably goes through this stuff. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize it until later on in life where I could yeah. think of and look back, but that's what set me up. I had a great father. There's no doubt about that. Uh, he, he also said, Hey, it's all about pain and suffering. And he was sort of like, you know, I used to be white trash. I was poor. I had to steal food from a garbage can. And he, he even taught me how to shoot bottle rockets at cars and, you know, do a lot of crazy stuff, like steal watermelons and things. He thought we might go poor, but, uh, so I had a good father and then there was grit from the actual childhood. But then he said, that's grit's good, man. It's like, it's all, it's all good, you know? And so he was saying, this is, this is toughens you up. <laughs> and so, you right. know, so I, I had a good father that went along with that as well. So that's wonderful yeah, to have that yeah. support. A lot of kids don't have that type of support. Mm-hmm. And so how did you come to the realization that you wanted to go into the military, given your uh-huh. physical circumstances? Well, <laughs> I didn't think so at the time we just looked at it's you either go to college in the 80s or early 80s or you join the military at least where I come from it was either one or the other well um so academics was pretty much out of the question just because there was so there was so much academic evidence that showed that whether it be high school counselors whether it be fell in the first grade whether it just be school there was so I, I just sort of knew that college was not going to be in the cards, even though mm-hmm. it was later in the story. I did I do have three college degrees, but no. But at the time, I thought, well, it has to be the the military, the army, U.S. Army. And well, a good question would be, well, I did join the army because that was either army. You either go to college, you either go to war, or you go to you know jail, or you go into the college or whatever. So the army was a choice, and that's where I went to. And I, I lied. I, I did not tell them about my physical frailties. I said, no, I'm fine. No problems. This was before the internet, before they could check all your records. And I said, no, I'm fine. And I just slid in that way physically from an, now from an academic standpoint, I didn't join it. So in the beginning, I didn't join the regular, I joined the national guard. It was okay. a less than, and then I eventually went in the army. So my academic test, what I don't know is the academic test. How did you uh, I don't know that question. I don't think I did. I think they just uh-huh. passed me on through. It was not the best. It was the National Guard. We were nas- nasty girls is what they used mm-hmm. to call us. We were the less than best. And so I went in that way and then I went on active duty. So I sort of slimed my way into the military, what, which is a, considered a professional organization. So, yeah. Was it difficult to pass the physical agility, agility exams? So physically, I could walk and talk and chew gum at the same time. Um, mm-hmm. and I could run the minimum and I could do the minimum push-ups and sit-ups and they built me up when I went into basic training. And, and I also worked on myself, but know that that, that was, uh, okay. I was like maybe average to, I was probably below average at that time. Um, academically, I don't know how I passed the interest. I think they just threw me in. I just said, go for it. And, uh, they probably just needed numbers. Uh, agility tests, yes, I could walk and I could run, but not a lot. And uh, and so, but eventually they did build me up and I built myself up over a period of time in the army. So. Excellent. That's awesome. And never did you doubt that you could do it? Oh, in the beginning, I didn't. So I almost got thrown out in the very beginning. I was the worst of the privates. Uh, we had a, well, we had a platoon at Fort Sill, Oklahoma in 1983. There's about 50 of us. Um, and I was one of the worst and because I just, and it was not the physical part. It was the academic part of just mm-hmm. trying to drink that water that was coming out of the fire hose so fast. And I couldn't get it. I couldn't, under, the acronyms, the language, the, the military jargon, mm-hmm. and, I'm, and all the things you're supposed to do 
in a quick amount of time was really, so they thought that I would be, they, they wanted to throw me out. So instead of throwing me out, they sent me and another private, the two worst out of the platoon to a criminal correctional facility. Criminal correctional facility is for criminals. I was not a criminal. Uh, me and this other guy just were not getting it. We were not adapting well to the army. So there was a drug deal with the sergeants where they said, well, let's send these two sorry privates over there and let them get their asses kicked at a wow. different level of hell. It was kind of like one of those scared straight programs they used to have. Let's show teenagers what jail is like. Mm, and, scare uh, tactics. Yeah, it's a scare tactic. It was a motivational fear tactic. And uh, it worked on me, maybe too well, gave me a little bit more. Uh, but the other guy broke and he got out and I stayed in. More importantly than that, what the drill sergeant was trying to do was improve the entire platoon through, we come back from that facility after only four hours, all bloody and broken up and our uniforms were torn from doing all types of physical fitness and various obstacle courses at a different level of hell. And they come, we come back all but bleed. And so, but he was also, he was trying to break me. Uh -huh. And also we were guinea pigs for the platoon. So that's a unique story of its own. I attempted to find it. I can't find anything like that, but that's, that does not happen in the army. Let me tell you on record, that doesn't happen. It happened to me. It's okay. just, it's just one of those weird yeah. stories. So, yeah. <laughs> and so 31 years in the United States army and you experienced quite an up and down roller coaster. Mm, yeah, what? that's the yeah the roller what coaster. Can you ride. tell us about your journey on this roller coaster in the military? Woo! It the ups and the downs were really up, and then there were really down. Um, the I mean, once I got out of basic training, once I went through that hill I described, and and basic training and criminal correctional facility, that sort of tweaked my mind. It sort of like I went through a different level of hell where I thought, well. I don't care about what everybody thinks because I think in my mind, my seven, eight, well, just newly formed 18 year old mind mm -hmm. that I could probably do more than what they're telling me. And I said, well, I think college is an option. I know they said they can't do it, but I said, I'm going to try college. So that tweaked me. That was a sort of a, a come to Jesus. Like I went through, I couldn't explain it, but I just knew that I could probably do more just because of what I went through. And I, mm -hmm. so therefore I went to college. And, um, and then that, that's where it started as far as academics. And I went to a junior college. Everything was from the bottom. I went to a, a less than best, a junior college where they took, take anybody, lame, lazy, or crazy. Some of those, you've got <laughs> community colleges that will do that. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just go in, they forgive you of everything, whatever. Right. And then I did that and I, and I, I built myself up academically and my confidence to transfer into a, a, a reputable university. Clemson University, and then I graduated there. It wasn't in engineering, it was an education, but whatever it took for me to, you know, get to that level. And I did that. And I went through ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps. At the time, I thought, well, I can be an officer, I can be a leader in the army. Yeah. Because, and uh, so I, and I went, to, I tasted ROTC, and I thought, this is nothing. And <laughs> academics were something, I had to work at that. Uh, ROTC was nothing to me because I had already been through a level of hell. Right. That, so it was, it was like preschool for you. Yeah, ROTC. It was preschool. <laughs> so I just sort of like, to me, I just like, okay. And so I went through ROTC and that was nothing. It was the academics I had to take my time. At. And so, yeah. And it set me up to get a college degree and to be a leader, a commissioned officer in the military. That's how that beginning phase hit. And uh, so, yeah, that's what I was looking at right there. That's incredible. So then the ROTC basically, basically lifted you up because you realized that you already had gone through something a little, a lot more intensive. <laughs> mm, yeah. Oh yeah. And it, it set me up. It gave me a whole lot of confidence. I've got a college degree. I'm an officer in the military. I can get away with murder. <laughs> and so, I'm, but I didn't, you, you're not above the law. And my confidence went so level high up that I said, well, I don't, I can, I can fly through red lights and stop signs. I can do all kinds. Of, I can get away with, I can do anything, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily true. The law, you also have to deal with the law. And so I did get in trouble with the law, uh, not only driving under the suspension of a driver's license, but also driving under the influence. And I thought that I, I just thought I could get away. So my confidence went from really low to too much high. 
right. too much higher. I think I can do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was, had a quiet confidence. I was always good. Uh, I was always a humble person, but I thought I can, I, I've already done what they said they can't do. And, uh, but then I had to get knocked down by a little bit with the law. And that, that set me a little bit more straight, more on path. I you know, see, more, yes. you can have confidence, but don't like think that you're better than the law. Or, or don't think that you're invincible. Invincible. I thought I was, yeah, running stop signs. Uh, yeah, I can, I can handle it all. I've been through osteomyelitis, learning disabilities, and I'm right. I'm paving them. And so, yeah, so that's in my younger years, I've got a lot, a lot of, a lot of trouble. And uh, that's how the downs. And so when you're in the military and you get in trouble, it's a different form of trouble. Uh, meaning you're you're held to a higher standard and you have to face a different wind mm -hmm. and um i just thought that i could face anything after all that and uh, i had to get myself knocked down a little bit especially with the driving under the influence where it went through a two-year pro legal process and i almost got thrown out that would be my second time of almost getting thrown out now so criminal correctional facility when i wasn't adjusting that was just my inability the my fault was the driving under suspensions that was one fence and then the and getting to jail with that and then the driving under the influence that really knocked me down and says you know I can, I can be confident but I can't be that confident with everything so right yeah Jason how were you thrown under the bus and ghost lighted oh. by your own superiors now that was not my so in organizations, I didn't, I was a senior guy with a whole lot of experience when this occurred. Ghost lighting. How, how long have you been in the military by now? Oh, uh, active duty, uh, 18, 19 years. 18, so about 18, 19 years. 19 years in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning on active duty. I'd already been over 20. I had done a whole lot. I had, as far as military time, total military time, you're looking at over, over 20 years, but for retirement purposes, which was in my mind to get out there. Yeah, I was only 18 years. And so, no, I had a whole lot of experiences. I had a whole lot of awards and even I had done a lot. I had been deployed many times. And so when this occurred, I was a senior person in the military. I was a Lieutenant Colonel, which would be a senior manager. And um, I never knew anything about a ghost lighting or a under the bus. I just I understand you can make mistakes and get, you know, like I did before, but I didn't know that your own people would try to throw you. It's called a takeout or a takedown. So in the military or in the government, how this thing works, I'm trying to develop the story is that if you become senior or whatever, mid-level manager, um, you're pretty much in. You're, you, you've got it. I mean, you, they, I mean, you have to really kill somebody or do something really, really stupid to get thrown out. It's hard to get thrown out. You've already developed your time and grade in the military. And so people that are smart you know, are, are just mean. Uh, and if they don't like you, they can uh, do things, create rumors to take you out or to transfer you. Usually it's a transfer. It's, they call it passing the trash. Let's, let's, let's make some stuff up and let's get the attention of high level people to either get him out uh -huh. uh, or, or taken us. And so that's, well, what happened was there was a few things that happened in this one. Every, every two to three years, we have to move to a different group of people in the military and uh -huh. to a group, a different organization. Yes, we're still in the army, but every three years or two to three years or four, we move into a different clique, a different organization. Uh -huh. And that's what I did was I went back to Korea on uh, my third time. I'd already had a lot of experience in South Korea. I was pretty experienced over there. I just went into a different group of people where I did not get along with the things that were going on there, meaning okay. they wanted me to do a whole lot of things that were research oriented and writing oriented, meaning towards science, where it's just my job. I just I disagreed where my strengths and my job were occur. And I just I thought that I could do better in another place. In other words, my competency level would be better in a different, it was a professional disagreement. Well, mm -hmm. that didn't work out. Everybody's got a little turf battle. I mean, kids got their little bus stops and things, but even in professional life, we've got it. And yes, was I different? Yeah, of course we described my differences and um, they just didn't like, want, they didn't like me there basically. And they didn't want me there. And so I faced various allegations. I'll say, I'm gonna go to the first one, which was hazy. And it was more personal and not official. The first one was that I'm a pedophile. 
So I, I had my, my daughter was in the soul. She, she went to the elementary school. I go, I went to the elementary school to eat lunch with her and I was a playful father, but I was not a pedophile. Mm -hmm. So the rumor around the community was that I was a pedophile. Well, that was just a rumor that didn't mm -hmm. work. Once that didn't work, the, the, then it went to more official. I'll give them credit. If they get, didn't get me in one way, they tried to get me in another one. Mm -hmm. Once the pedophile thing that was a rumor didn't occur, then I became a spy. In other words, I went under a criminal investigation, uh, an investigation of uh, giving or passing on information to foreign nationals. This was more formal. So they said, okay, well, I had, I had to face the wind to the criminal investigation division and the military intelligence of the U.S. Army on charges that I was passing on government information to, uh, you know, foreign nationals, mm -hmm. which was, this was also totally bogus, but right. this was more in line with official complaints. Mm -hmm. So I went from a pedophile to a spy within two years. And then- Wow, that's then, heavy. Yeah, it's heavy. It's almost like a movie. At the time, yeah. I, thought I, was, I thought I was in a movie. I, was, I thought it could be a movie character at the time. Right, yeah. But my anxiety wow. went up. I thought this was going to be another time, not my fault time, where I get thrown out of the military. And I had to face my, I had to talk to my defense attorney. We had a defense attorney that told me that, you know, I, I've heard charges and I've heard the complaints, but if you're not doing anything, they don't have anything on you. But what they're going to be doing is they're going to be following you around, taking pictures of you off post, monitoring your yeah. activities. And that went on for two years uh, that I was there in South Korea and nothing happened. And um, nothing. So continuously, happened. these rumors, these fake, ac fake false accusations went on for two years. Well, probably for, yeah, two years from 2008 until 2000. It was only when I was there. So once I left that assignment, everything went away. There was no more charges of any. And this was the only time it was only in this group of people that it occurred. And I know who was behind it. Matter yeah. of fact, I kind of, I kind of, I tested the, I tested the waters to see who was behind it. Uh -huh. I was, I, I had a little bit of a rascal. I do have a little bit of a rascal in me or a little bit of mischievousness <laughs> in me. And so uh, they, I was invited to a Christmas party where I saw the guy. Um, and well, there was a clique of people, but I, I think I knew who, the, who was behind it. I went over there and I said, well, you know, I'm going to stay here in South Korea. I'm not moving away. Uh -huh. And I, I knew that was a key because I, once, you know, I told you once I left, everything went away. But I told him, I lied. I lied to him. I said, you know, I'm staying here. Well, he turned on his heels, walked away. The next day, that was a Friday night. The uh -huh. next day on a Saturday, one of his subordinates called me up, wanting to create a professional organization. Uh -huh. and I don't want to go into the details of this, but I thought that was a strange phone call. I never heard from him before. And then on Monday, <laughs> all hell broke loose with the emails saying we're going to create some professional organization. It was just another game. So I pissed someone off and they called Washington, D.C. called me because I was a senior person and said, what the hell is going on in South Korea, Jason? <laughs> uh, I said, well, you know, sir, uh, you know, I lied and I told them I was going to stay here. That's all that happens. What about this professional organization they're trying to create? I said, Right? There ain't nothing. It, it, it's about me lying and staying here. It ain't about nothing. This is just a game. I tell, I tell you, it's, it's, a, it's a personal thing. And so, but no, I, so I knew who's behind it. And uh, I did, I did that to test what was going on. But no, um, if I would have stayed there, I would have become, I would have been a drug smuggler, or I would have been a human trafficker. And other, there yeah, would be another. They would have kept adding false there accusations. There would be something after else. False I mean, yeah, exactly. I, I do give them credit where you know, get hit them on that side, they give them a hand on that side, mm -hmm. and so, so they're whatever it takes to get the attention of people. And uh, I think when I just just thinking <laughs> when when I told them I lied, and I said I pissed this particular person off by telling them I was going to stay. That they they probably pass that on to people that were really important to try to understand what was going on. So. Uh, because they heard of all, um, you know, they call it secret. And there's a federal investigation of spying and giving intelligence away. And then there's pedophile. And so yeah. I think by saying that, and then they just said, I, I don't know, they don't have proof on it, but I think they just said, well, Jason just pissed some people off over there. And that's why yeah. all this other shit happened. But I don't, that's just speculation for me. So yeah. Jason, but I'm no. wondering, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm wondering because this is some high level stress stuff. 
How oh, did yeah. you cope with this stress? I mean, this is traumatic. How did you cope with it while you were over there? What were your coping oh, mechanisms? Gosh. What did you do to calm yourself down during all that anxiety and all that stress? Well, I had a daughter and I had a wife. And so my wife told me, just stay, just do what you're doing. Continue on your path. Don't, it doesn't, everything's cool with here in this little community that we're in. It's all, so continue on with that. I did go to the chaplain just to kind of gather my spirits together to have him pray and talk to me a little bit. I did go to a, a mental health counselor when it was at the time, it was not good to go to mental health counselor. Mm-hmm. I did go to, I go to them and talk to them. And then I had my family there. And then there was a few trusted friends that I would talk to, but um, mm-hmm. that's, and I would work out like a rat, like a gym rat to yeah. process it out. And I, I learned that the left, right, left process of an elliptical machine or just like just crying and laughing and uh, whatever, giving your emotions out well, I was in a very, a very emotional state, uh, mm-hmm. but I, I, it was an accident that occurred that where I was allowing myself to grieve or to get mad or angry while I was going through physical processing uh, and uh, w- with no technology, with just images of my head. And then it was like a vomiting and I would do that uh, every day, every day. And uh that was another technique that I did. Yeah. That's incredible. So you had spousal support, support from your daughter and uh, some type of counseling and the physical exercises helped you to release a lot of the stress and bring you into alignment with staying where you needed to stay and staying confident with who you are as a human being. Exactly. You're spot on with that. You're spot on with that. And then by, we all know family and friends and colleagues and mental health counseling, they, they can help. What was really special about this thing was the accident that occurred on an elliptical machine where I was just going through the process of like, we all work out, but then all of a sudden, bam, bam, it's like a vomit, ah, ah, and get mad or sad or whatever. You see these images and you're going, ah, and you're allowing it to come out. And that really helped a whole lot. And that was just by accident. I didn't read anything about that. Yeah. What do you mean it was by accident? You mean something literally happened to the elliptical machine and it kind of <laughs> right. So, so I, I've always been a, I've always been a gym nut, but I've never allowed myself to get emotional. I understand. Until, yeah. And so, yeah. So, and then, and then once that happened, I just allowed it to happen. In other words, if I wanted to, cr- I was crying on the machine. Uh, yeah. There was sweat pouring off the machine, of course, but no, no, no. I was, I thought I was going to break the machine, uh, but no, I just allowed the emotions to occur on the machine while I was doing the exercises. And that's what, what I was talking about. You know, what's incredible about that, Jason, is that a lot of disease and a lot of pain, a lot of traumas, they stay stored in the body unless you move your body. And you were moving your body and naturally you went with that motion and you were releasing it and moving your body at the same time was just what's supposed to be done in order to release any type of stresses that stay stagnant within parts of your body. So it's really incredible that you adapted that way and you were able to be resilient in a way that you didn't even know you had it in you. That's really incredible. Yeah, I, I never. And so when I went through professional uh, later on, I went through professional help and I heard about the EMDR, I don't know what it stands for. Yes. It's a, yeah, so it's a left, right, left mechanism where I've literally been on the floor crying with that. Right, technique. right, right. And so, but that's what I was doing before that I went to the professional. I'm thinking, you know what? I've, I've done this before, but it was in a different way. Yeah, yeah, you were healing yourself. I was healing myself. Yeah, I was healing myself. Naturally, without anyone training you or showing you how, that's really incredible. And it was, I, 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 I considered an accident that occurred and uh, it was a good accident that. I yeah, just, a good accident. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, and you know what, and even today, if I'm, you know, and I'll go, uh, what my, what a good technique also I've learned, I'll, I'll still do that. Not to that degree because I wasn't in that much pain, but I'll still do that. Uh, but what I've also found out was it's called a cold, hot therapy. In other words, get into a hot sauna and then jump into a cold pool. And in Oof. Korea, South Korea, and many places around the world, they'll have this, it's called a contrast effect to where you uh, get your blood vessels really hot and sweaty. Uh-huh. And then you go back and you squeeze them in. And right. then you do it two or three different times. And uh, it's uh, 
really pretty cool to me. I, I, I do that. And uh, if you can't do it in a, you know, like sometimes you can have a gym has a sauna uh -huh. or a hot, and then you go to a cold shower. But now I, I, I found a facility where it has a cold bath. Where I'm yeah, that's supposed to reset your immunity, your central your nervous system. It's supposed to do all kinds of stuff. I personally can't do that, but that's incredible <laughs> that you can do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's really pretty cool. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, when I was in South Korea, I forgot the name, but they have a lot of them over there and they have them in Europe as well. But um, I, I hopefully, hopefully they'll take up. They're in big cities here. Like if you go to Los, I you know you're in California, I think in Los Angeles, in the big cities where you find a Korean population, you'll find those facilities there. But I, I, I'll be out there hanging out with the Koreans doing those things. <laughs> all over, you know? So, yeah. Jason, tell us about your book. What's the title of it and what inspired you to write it? So this is called A Soldier Against All Odds. It's on Amazon, A Soldier Against All Odds. I love that. Um, well, it was about defying the odds, which we talked about. It's dedicated to my father, who was the greatest influencer in my life. Um, I what I get you know, I'd always known that I'd always known that I had stories and just talking about the first grade and the, just beginning to get into college. Mm -hmm. I knew that I had defied many things early on, but you don't write it. Well, I, most people don't write a book until they've got until they're you're comfortable with your family members and friends and things. My mother and father have, have passed away, but I, I thought that this would be a good time to write it. It was nagging on my head for years and years. And uh, I said, well, I, I'll have to hire a ghostwriter. And I, and I did that. And I, it was a two, two, it was a two and a half, three year process. It was probably talk about fear, being vulnerable and doing the damn book was more fearful than going to Afghanistan. And I would rather be shot at, <laughs> it's like, but this was a hard book. It was just because of the, the vulnerability to put it out. And that mm -hmm. was the hardest part. And it nearly did kill me. Matter of fact, in my testimony on the page where I was, I, well, I've had anxiety attacks over the book that's okay but when you go to the icu and you're scheduled to die because you're sitting down stressing too long that's where it really hit me and i almost died there because of blood clots and things that had formed in my lungs and legs i had pneumonia and uh, because i had just stressed out over the book and i sat down too long and i was not exercising like i was normally wow. and uh, but i came back i came back from the dead no you know i was in three i was three three days in the icu but they they didn't have much hope for me at the time and uh but then i, I went to a normal regular hospital and then i i recovered from that but um but and no, that was no, a no. result of uh stress just, from sitting down stress and just... sitting down and not exercising like i normally did and i had stress mm -hmm. that was building up because i was seeing my life events unfold in yeah. black and white we all say we got a story. Once you put it in black and white, then that does a number to, it did a number to me. I don't know. It did a number to me. I said, oh my God, am I going to put this out there? Am I good enough? And, and, and yeah. what are they going to think about me when I put this shit out? And so that's what was in my mind. And I thought, I, I don't know if I can do this. And I was, and so I was stressing out. And um, once I got out of the ICU and I come back, uh, then I said, well, I'm going to stand up now. I'm never going to sit down again. Yeah. And so, so I said, I, so I'm sitting down now, but I, I'm taking blood thinners, but um, I had a, I had a stand up desk for most of the part I stand up, but that just, I said, well, you've been sitting down stressing too much over the damn book. Well, yeah. That's what killed you. They thought I was a smoker. I said, no, I don't smoke. I'm not a smoker. And, uh, so, but no, that was what it was. And, um, and it was the hardest part was the vulnerability, uh, of, of just, Unle unleashing the good the bad and the ugly in front of yeah. everybody and that, i can yeah. understand that jason when i when i was writing my book i mean i there were chapters where i was just flowing tears and i was just thinking like do i really want to say this do i really want to put this out there and times where it just i, I was crying i mean it was it was really Ooh, tough oh yeah crying but you know at the very end i felt like a, a bricks off my shoulders did you have the same feeling yeah i had there's a number of things where i thought well I've gotten over this. I've gotten over that. It's kind of a getting over a cathartic uh, mechanism and mm -hmm. uh, always had an issue with my mother. And once I went through this and I researched it, I didn't have any problem with my mother. And some of the problems that I had, especially during the investigation, where it was really, I wanted to, there, there's only, there, we talked about the investigation. That was the only time I, I really dreamed uh, of killing people or maiming people. And that went down. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it went from a, a 10 to about a five which is a good meaning, uh, meaning nightmares 
uh, I'm talking about physically, in other words, dreaming of, yeah, night, well, yeah, it, it, it was nightmares, daymares, and then flashbacks. I had a lot of flashbacks of that, what we talked about. I had a lot of anxiety attacks just on that one chapter yeah. of the, the, the false accusations. Oh, yeah. That's what I would just like, I would have, I would walk around in the day and I just like, oh my God. And I would have these anxiety attacks on that one chapter. So that went down from a 10 to about a five, which was good. And so, uh, but no, it was, uh, and then also just the crazy little stories we all have. But, you know, the, the, the ghostwriter had trained me, he says, the, the more heart you give, the more you give, the vulnerability you give, the better story it's going to be and the more help it might be for someone because you've got to come down to that human level. Exactly. Um, the, the story is about success, but it's through a painful part of its success. Mm. And, you know, at, at, when I was going through these ups and downs at the time, I thought at the time, I thought I'm, I was always blessed or very lucky, or I don't know how this is happening, but I didn't, I didn't expect these good things to happen because pain and failure were just like, that's part of life from the very beginning. So I yeah. thought that any, it, it, at any moment I could be thrown off or kicked yeah. out because yeah. that's how I was developed. And so so in my mind, I was very thankful of the promotions and the schools and the opportunities that I had. And I, and I thought at any moment <laughs> that it could be taken away. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and so because just, just because of pain. So when that investigation and all the false accusations occurred, I thought this is my time that I'm going to get kicked out. And, and it might be for things that I never did before. And I was very fearful of that. Um, because I did want to get my 20 active, I wanted to retire from the military and I didn't want to be, cause that's where my money's going to come from. And right. so I was, so, that's, so I was, yeah, so I was very uh, anxious about that, you know, but it so, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. So if a reader picks up your book, what would you say is the biggest takeaway? No matter what, no matter what phase of life that you think you're in, no matter what troubles that you think you can always you can always look at someone from a different angle to give inspiration and hope. This is audible. It's not, I am the R, I'm the narrator and I am the author. It's coming from the horse's mouth. You're going right. to see true, brutal honesty. If you don't want to listen, you can listen to it or you can see, you know, your iPod, the little fear. You can hear it through there for, as a test run. But I, I am nothing special as far as an academic. And I, I did rise and I did get my degrees. Inspiration and hope and survival, persistence and a grit. I think grit is, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of folks don't, know about grit and grit is just going through pain and dealing with it and i don't know if a lot of people these days understand grit you'll you'll see a whole lot of grit grit was just introduced to me early and i just took grit for granted but grit uh, i think you know i think grit is good you know yeah yeah could you explain could you go a little deeper into that how grit is good i know you talked about it a little bit in the beginning of, with your father and stuff but yeah, how can grit. we explain it a little further for our grit, listeners i mean grit is like when you have okay maybe your parents or maybe you have kids and whatever right. allowing them to fail is wonderful right. i mean allowing them to fall down and skin their knees or maybe get booted off of a team a football team or a baseball team or allowing them to just this is the way it is. This is part of life. And I still love you. And I still, we, we can still go forward and, but don't baby them. In other words, like this is just life and you'll get over this and it'll go, there's ups and there's downs. And then you learn a whole lot down in the valleys and uh, you go through the valley. We all want to be on the mountain. So, but you can't stay on the mountain because the mountain is not life. The mm -hmm. mountain is either going up the mountain or you're going down the mountain. <laughs> so, right. so you, you can, you can uh, create these moments with your kids or with other people to know that this is normal and say, and it's okay to be compassionate and empathetic with them when it's mm -hmm. happening, but don't baby them and allow them to say, well, you know, you, you want them allow, allow them to get the grit. And the grit would be something that would allow them to feel the pain uh, because, right. you know, that's just part of life. And that's when I talk about grit, I'm talking about allow them to feel that pain, that grit go across their skin and, um, and just say that, hey, uh, I love you. I want to, I'm empathetic, but guess what? This is life and we can, you can go, you can get stronger from this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I love this. You can get stronger from this because, um, you know, I'm, when, as you're saying this, as you're saying this, what I'm thinking is that a lot of things have changed generationally 
And it seems that people a lot more lately are babying their kids and their children and not allowing them to fall and go through this grit. And helicopter, so, they, call, they call it helicopter parenting, which I am not. A hel- I'm not a helicopter yeah. parent. I don't want to be a helicopter grandparent either. So, no, so, no let them, allow, allow them to fail. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because yeah. there is success in failure. Oh, gosh. And, and failure oh, gosh. is not fatal and failure is not final. And neither is success. Success is not final either. So whether you fail or whether you fall down or stand back up, it's just all a natural part of thing. And the grit part of that is allowing the person to go through it, still supporting them, telling them that it's a nat- you love them. It's a natural part of life and that it's, it's also okay to feel pain. Oh, yeah. It's okay to feel pain. And I didn't really understand that until much later. It took me a while to figure it out. But uh, yes, uh, pain is a part of life and failure is a part of life. And matter of fact, we fail every day. We, if, you, if you think about it, we're probably yeah. failing everything. Yeah. If, if, you, if you went down and got into the details. Uh, but, right. no, uh, but no, that's just part of it. And there's, I, I like it, the ups, the, the mountains and the valleys and things. And uh, so... Um, but no, that's just part of life and how to raise and how to think of it. And uh, I'm sure I'm going to be failing and making mistakes and things of that nature. And I, I mean, my daughter, um, she's, we had Father's Day and I told my daughter, I says, you know, I just want to let you know, I may not have been the best father, but I did the best I could. And I just want to let you know that, you know, I'm, st- I'm still love you and I, I'm not good with showing my emotions. And uh, I am trying to be the best father I can, even though you're an adult now. And she, she took that. She said, I understand that. And so, but, uh, you know, we all have, and the parents, a lot of, lot of, lot of children, and even me, would like bust their father and their mother on this. And they didn't do this. They didn't do that. But there, I think most people are just trying to do what they can to do the best they can. They're not trying to hurt people. They're just trying to do the best they can regardless of the situation and uh, you can look at it as this or that but I know my mother and my father they didn't, they weren't perfect but I know at the time I'm thinking man I wish they could do this and this and this but I think they were just doing the best that they could under the circumstances that they were you know involved in you know? Lieutenant Colonel Jason Pike everybody on a little less fear podcast the Dr. Lino show incredible story his book a soldier against all odds is on Amazon. Is that correct? It's on Amazon. Yeah. You'll find it in your browser, A Soldier Against All Odds. It's on Amazon. Um, you, you find it on Audible if you want to listen to the book. And uh, so, yeah, just type it in your browser. And I'm on, um, J- I got a website, jasonpike.org, jasonpike.org. And I'm connected to all the social media on, on there. You'll see the social media sites there. So on jasonpike.org, we can find all of your social media handles as well. Incredible story. Thank you so much for being vulnerable on the show, for showing your emotions, your pure heart. I can see you're just an incredible human being, resilient survivor. Your grit story really inspired me, and I'm sure it's going to inspire all of these listeners. Thanks so much for sharing all of your wisdom. I wish you, your family, so much love and light. And do you have any final words? Hey, show up the right place. Just show up. Show up at the right place at the right time with the right attitude. You'll be doing better than most. Yeah. <laughs> I had to write this down. Just show up at the right time and the right place. <laughs> the right, the right attitude, attitude. Right attitude. You'll be doing better than most. You can be a dummy and you'll be doing better than most. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Thank All you right. so much. And I wish you an incredible day now. Take care. Take care, man. Take care. Bye.